Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, for this presentation. And we're going to be talking about From Weeds to Wheels. Um, I'm Professor Katrina Cornish at The Ohio State University. Now, U.S. farms produce our food and can also produce materials and, and fuels. But did you know we could also produce our rubber, which we'd use in things like rubber gloves and tires? Natural rubber today is still collected by hand, not in the US, but for wages of only two to $10 a day. And it's grown in rows like we see here, and a tapper goes out usually at night, makes an incision in the pre-dawn hours, and the latex dribbles out that white stream and is collected in those little cups. Now, how much do they collect this way? Well, last year, they collected about 14 million tons. Now, it's really tough to get your head around a number that big. So I've calculated this out in full-grown African male elephants. We see one right here. So how many do you think you actually would collect? What's the equivalent? Well, if we do it on how many elephants a minute? Do you think it's one elephant a minute? Less than that? More than that? It's actually 12 elephants a minute, all collected into that one little cup. So all around, so it's absolutely amazing. So how many different things do you think are made with natural rubber to use so much? Well, do you think it's 10, 100, 1,000? If you want to guess, you could put your answer in the private chat window or in the chat window that you should be able to see on your screen. But otherwise, it's actually 50,000 different things made with natural rubber. Now, the original quintessential rubber item is actually the eraser. In England, we actually call that a rubber. And the name rubber comes from the ability of it to rub out or erase pencil marks. So that's what it's actually called after. But among the other 50,000, of course, baby bottles and baby pacifiers, rubber bands, we call ourselves a rubber bandit sometimes. Then in uh, children's balloons, you know, what would a party be without balloons? And then if you play sporting events, like this is a picture of a soccer goalie, his hands trying to catch the ball, but if you play any sport in the rain, your equipment will have rubber surfaces on the fronts. So otherwise you can't catch the ball in the wet. If you use a synthetic rubber, that won't happen. It'll be too slippery. And then in tires, tires are the largest market for rubber. These are airplane tires and they're 100% natural rubber in that rubber component. Now, there's other things in there, of course, but there's no synthetic rubber, only natural rubber in there. The synthetic rubber is made from petroleum. Now, globally, natural rubber can be grown in the tropical areas, shown here in the green areas. However, although the rubber tree actually originates in the Amazon basin, nearly all the rubber production these days comes from Southeast Asia, the other side of the world, literally 12 hours time difference from us. And Asia produces 89% of the global rubber supply. Africa has some production, but only about 8%. And the Americas only have 3%. And this is because of fatal uh, endemic diseases that will kill the rubber tree if it's grown in rows together, like you saw in that early picture. Now, if we look at the real grayness of Europe, Asia, and, and North America, you can see that there's no green areas and there's no natural rubber production in those areas at all. We have to import all we need. Now, these trees, as I mentioned, are grown very close together, but they're also genetically identical. It's like identical twins, only there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. But each tree is touching the neighbor. So it's the leaves are touching, the branches are touching, and the roots are touching. So if one gets sick, well, trees can't wear masks like we can, so the next one will get sick, and it will spread very, very rapidly because they're exactly the same, have exactly the same genes. And so if leaf blight, which is a leaf destroying disease attacks, the trees will get sick and then they will all die. So can, do, we, do we have any alternative to relying on this really risky supply? Well, yes, we can grow rubber in the US. We just don't yet in any, in any significant amount. So this is a field in Ohio showing the rubber root dandelion. It's not the one in your yard, so please don't send me the ones in your garden. It's not the same species. That's a, that's a cousin that doesn't make rubber. But this can be grown in an annual crop in the northern states. 
Then we also have another species. It's a little bush, comes from the Chihuahuan Desert in the south of the country. And we can farm this in the semi-arid southwest. This field is in Arizona. Now we can grow this up and then cut the tops off and grow it up again from the same plants. Uh, so we can have annual harvests, so a harvest every year, of something that's actually a perennial bush. So we don't have to keep replanting it every year. We do have to replant the dandelion every year, of course. And then this is a picture of the rubber. So rubber root dandelion, which we also call Buckeye gold, uh, is uh, a very solid rubber. It's very similar to the rubber dried from the latex tapped from the rubber tree. So it's very similar to tropical rubber. But Waiuli has another advantage. We can grind that up and make it in, extract it in the form of a latex. So this looks very much like the latex you can tap from the tree. So we could turn that into solid rubber if we want, or we can make products that need the rubber to be in that form, like a paint. This also has another really good advantage and it doesn't cross react with type one latex allergy. So if you know anybody with latex allergy, they can't use rubber things, natural rubber things, because it might trigger a life threatening allergic reaction, which would be pretty horrible. But my Yuli is also very soft and strong and stretchy, and we can make specialty expensive products with it. And what we've shown here are what are called radiation attenuation medical gloves. Now, you don't really have to know what that's all about, but if a surgeon is doing, a, doing an operation where they're using a radioactive source to kill a tumor, for example, at the moment they have to wear one glove to protect them from disease and another glove on top to protect themselves from radiation. Wyuli is so, such a nice polymer that you can actually do both things in one glove. Because if you imagine you're wearing two gloves, it's like doing surgery in boxing gloves. It's also not a good idea. So this is, this is a very nice uh, uh, initial product from this material. Now, the rubber from both crops can be used to make tires and it's very high quality. And we can see here, this is a tire made from dandelion rubber. Continental Rubber did this in Germany. And then here we have our own Cooper tire in Finley, Ohio, and they made this lovely uh, Waiuli tire and that's completely made of natural rubber. Your car tires have about half of their elastomer made from um, uh, synthetic rubber. But in this case, this is 100% natural rubber tire made from Waiuli. Now, if we look at production, I already showed you this field, but you know, if we're looking at the dandelion, you have to grow it either in the field or in hydroponics, which we show in this bottom one. But you would then harvest the roots of either of these crops. Here's a big pile of roots. We then extract them and we have a pilot processing plant in Worcester, Ohio at the university. And then when you extract it, you extract with solid rubber. Um, you can't do latex rubber yet from this species. So it comes out in lumps like that. So you can't make gloves or balloons, but you can make things like shoes and tires. And so we, but while we only have a small amount, we think they should go into something like premium basketball shoes or, or trainers, something like that. And now I'm going to move this over to my student, Haley Stockham, who's going to talk to you about some of the work with hydroponics and rubber dandelion. So Haley, to you. Hi, um, I'm Haley Stockham. I am a graduate student, Dr. Cornish master's program. Um, I actually came to OSU after working a couple years in industry. So it's never too late to learn something new if you've th thought about getting your master's degree or continuing on. But anyway, so hydroponics might seem like a big word if you haven't heard it before, but it, all it really means is that we're growing plants in water. No dirt required. So th these plants are able to take up water with their roots and the water contains the nutrients they need. So on the right, I have a small diagram of an ebb and flow system. So that refers to um, a cycle where the plant is not always in water. Sometimes it has a little room to breathe. <laughs> um, and once we have our seedling, it takes us about eight weeks till we have a dandelion we would think about harvesting. So if we wanted to, um, if we could go to the next slide, um, we can see what we need to grow rubber dandelions for with. So. You need a greenhouse or an indoor farm. You would need some electricity and water. So for your lights, pumps and your fans and some nutrients. And over on the right, 
you can see some of our seed cubes. Um, I've circled a larger plant in red, a medium plant in orange, and the smaller plant in yellow. So this is a good way for us to see what plants might be a better fit for our system when we get started. And here is our system. So on the right, on top, you can see how the dandelions sit on top, and then below there are, are all the controls that hold the water and the pumps to help this thing run. Um, so we are able to grow the dandelions in those little individual columns. Now, if we go to the next slide, we can see the largest dandelion that the system ever produced. That's about um, 300 grams. And uh, yeah, we can move on from that. We're good there. So I wanted to ask here, if, um, why do you think hydroponics might be a great method for rubber dandelion? So if we think about the problems you have when you grow your garden, um, and what might you experience? So one, you might have some weeds. It's kind of difficult to harvest when we try to pull up our plant and there's a lot of dirt on the roots. And you can't always control how much rain and how much light you get. And like I showed you, we can also see which plants are stronger or weaker early on. So we know which ones that, that we can go ahead and get rid of. And on the right, I have um, kind of the, one of the most interesting aspects is that we can also regrow the roots. So you can see a progression of first the roots were harvested and then about another eight weeks later, they were regrown, which is pretty cool. So multiple harvests from the same plant. Um, and like I said, eight weeks about. So what you can do is you can actually try some hydroponic stuff at home. And a really easy way is to regrow green onions in water. So I have with me one, one green onion right here and you can see the cut line. So where it goes from the brown to the brand new white onion. So you're going to want to cut it about like right here or so. And we're focusing on regrowing the shoot and not the root. Um, so if we wanted to go over to the next slide, I can, you can see a small list of supplies you'd want. So a bowl, a knife, cutting board, obviously you're going to want some supervision and just green onions. Um, and I think I have a picture on the next slide from one of our other lab members, just so you can see how quickly this happens. And even this, I cut this one last night and you can already see the new growth coming in. So it, it happens really fast. So you'll have some fresh green onions in no time. And so if we get back to rubber, we can look at how many roots would it take to make a tire. So before we know that, there are a few things we need to answer. And that would be how much natural rubber is in a tire. So depending on what your tire is used for, there's roughly a range of 20 to 50%. And we're only talking about the rubber portion and not the, not the entire metal components that you might also see in a tire. And we'd also need to know how much the rubber portion weighs. So we're thinking about 12 kilograms of the, of the part that contacts the road. So now I have a formula below and that, that kind of shows a calculation. And we also think that there's about 80 grams per rubber in one kilogram of roots. So we see after some math that um, we get about 30 kilogram of roots to make one tire. And so then the next question would be, how many plants do we need? So if we assume that one plant equals 50 grams of roots, and then it would take about 600 plants to make one tire. Now, it's going to take a lot of money to grow that many roots. And how can we figure that out? So I've got an example coming up. 
um, that shows kind of our thought process. So you might have not thought about starting your own rubber company before, but how about a lemonade stand? And so if you're gonna start your lemonade stand, what, what sort of things you would need to know? So we'd wanna know our recipe, our how many servings of lemonade we can make, and what kind of things we'll need to buy. So lemons, sugar, paper pitcher, and paper cups. So, and you also need to know how much your supplies are gonna cost so you can plan and spend your money wisely. Now, I've gone, I've come up with a list of supplies and our costs. So we'd need to spend about, uh, for lemons, about $2 for sugar. It's about 30 cents and paper cups about one dollar if you're going to make a pitcher that holds 10 servings so our selling price we're going to set at 50 cents a cup now to make your pitcher it's going to cost about three dollars three dollars and thirty cents total and if you sell every cup you're going to earn five dollars so if you sell every cup you earn a dollar seventy cents per pitcher, but we're also going to. You spent money on your new pitcher, and you probably want to earn that money back. So you're going to have to sell a few more cups. So let's look at um, why selling price can make a big difference here. So if we think about why things sell for different prices, we talk about quality. So for lemonade, which lemonade tastes better for natural rubber? Which rubber would work better for your shoes or your car? We think about our competition. How many other lemonade sellers are there? How much Havaya tree rubber is there? We think about required effort. Do you heat your lemonade and sugar or do you just stir it? Do you have some special sugar? And if we grow things hydroponically, that takes a lot of control and resources, like all the water and electricity. So going back, we have a, an estimation of how much, how many cups we'd need to sell. So we about 89 cups. But if we change the selling price, we can see that if it's too low, you would lose money per pitcher. But it if you can raise your price to 75 cents, you'd only need to sell 36 cups. And if you had super special lemonade that you can sell for a dollar, you'd only need to sell 23 cups. So we can think about the rubber dandelion in the same way. We would need to raise our selling prices because it takes a lot of effort and resources to grow the dandelions. Now, to do that, to help us grow more dandelions, we can use vertical farms. And I think Dr. Cornish actually is going to share a little more about this, how vertical farming can work for our project. Yes, so it, in a vertical farming system, we've partnered with a company called American Sustainable Rubber. And the picture on the right uh, is Tim Madden, who is president of that company, who was unfortunately not able to join us tonight. So as we saw with Haley, we need a lot of dandelions to make the rubber for one tire. So we need a large area for all those plants to grow. But in a vertical setting, you need much less area because you can stack them about 12 high. So we're doing this uh, in uh, initially in a new, brand new facility, it just opened this week, where we can do two different levels uh, with multiple treatments, multiple light regimes, so we can really optimize how fast we can make these dandelions grow. And then we also have been building, or not me, you know, American Sustainable Rubber and other vertical farmers are building indoor farm facilities. And this is an example of a hundred acre uh, indoor farm facility. And if we look inside, you can see all of these trays of plants, rows upon rows of them and columns upon columns of them. So you can see how much more you can produce in an indoor system than in a farm. However, it's obviously a lot more expensive. So you have to make sure you have a, a lot more dandelions in this system so that you can actually recoup those costs, i.e. the price of your lemonade pitcher, so that the rest is profit. So that so to feed this system and also the farm system, we're using biotechnology to increase the yield 
of our, of, of our dandelions as well, and our Wayuli plants, as well as uh, conventional plant breeding. And we're going to move now over to Menika, who's going to talk about this part. Hello everyone, my name is Menika and I'm a postdoctoral researcher working with Dr. Katrina. So I did my PhD and my master's uh, at Bowling Green State University, and then I joined Dr. Cornish lab here at OSU. So today I'm going to talk about how we use biotechnology and tissue culture to improve rubber dandelion. So first let's see what biotechnology is. So bio stands for biology and technology is tools. So biotechnology is simply a tool that uses biology to make new products. So this allows scientists to look closer at genes and make improvements in them. So here I have some examples where biotechnology is used in agriculture. It can be used to improve pest resistance, uh, um, herbicide resistance, and improve nutrients in crops. So how can we use biotechnology to improve rubber dandelion? So in our lab, we use several approaches to do this. So in the first approach, we increase the production of rubber in the rubber dandelions. So the production of rubber inside the plant is called the bio, bio, rubber biosynthesis. So normally the improved plants are larger than a normal plant and they have a larger root system. So rubber is produced in the roots of the dandelions. So larger roots means more rubber production. So our next approach is to prevent rubber coagulation. So what is rubber coagulation? For example, if we think of blood, when you have a cut on your skin, the blood will start to flow and then a scab will be formed on the surface to prevent further loss of blood. A similar thing happens with rubber. When you have a cut on the rubber tree, the rubber will start to flow and then a lump will be formed at the surface to prevent further loss of uh, latex. So th in this slide at the bottom, you can see this uh, lump of rubber. So we call this coagulated rubber. So this coagulated rubber or the lump of rubber makes the extraction process more difficult and complicated. So we use biotechnology to prevent this lump from forming and make the latex more free flowing so that we can easily extract rubber. And our next approach is to improve herbicide resistance. So an herbicide is a solution that farmers use to kill weeds. So weeds are a major problem in field grown rubber dandelions. So how can we kill dandelions without killing dandelions? So we do that using biotechnology to make improved herbicide resistance in rubber dandelion. So these improved plants will be able to survive an herbicide application that would kill the normal weeds in the field. So after doing these biotechnological improvements, we have to transfer these improved genes into the rubber plant. So what we do is we transfer the improved genes into the leaves or the roots of the rubber dandelion plants. So after transferring the improved genes in, into the roots or the leaves, we have to produce new plants from these roots and leaves. So for that, we use a technique called tissue culture. So tissue culture is a technique that we use in the lab to grow plants using small plant tissues like leaves and roots, and also using special nutrients. So the nutrients that we use in tissue culture look, looks like a jello that plants can grow on. So we pour them into petri dishes and test tubes. So if we are using roots um, for tissue culture, First, we cut the roots into small fragments and then we place the fragments on the jello, the nutrient medium. And then we just let it grow under light. So after a few weeks, small plants will um, start from these roots. And if we are using leaves, 
we cut the leaves into small pieces and then we place them on this special nutrient medium. After a few weeks, you will be able to see this green colored tissue starting from the leaves. So we call this tissue a callus. And after a few more weeks, this callus will develop into small plants. We call them plantlets. So these plantlets, they need more space to grow. So we transfer them from the petridish into these boxes. So these boxes have the same nutrient medium, but it has more space for the plant to grow. So after a few weeks, the plant will grow bigger. So these are some images of our tissue culture lab. So we place the tissue culture boxes and petri dishes on these racks. So these racks have special light conditions that we can adjust according to our requirements. So we adjust the light lights according to what dandelions need for growth. And then when the plants are big enough, we transfer them from that special medium into soil. So these racks of plants will go into the greenhouse and they will grow in the greenhouse until they're mature enough to be harvested. So when they're mature enough to be harvested, they'll be, the roots will be harvested and rubber will be processed. So that process will be explained by David Lankaitis. I'm uh, David Lankaitis. I'm a PhD student uh, working with Dr. Cornish. And so what I'm going to do for you guys is show you a few videos of our uh, rubber um, testing processes. Uh, so this first video, I'm going to show you a little bit with dandelion waiuli and where the process starts. Uh, so this is Dr. Cornish. She's in our processing plant that's in Worcester, Ohio. Uh, and the rubber extraction process starts with these dried dandelion roots. Uh, and what Dr. Cornish is showing us in this video is some of the roots, whenever they break, are held together by little threads, and you have to pull them apart to get them to fully separate. And what's actually holding those roots together are actual pieces of rubber. And so when we're breeding and using biotechnology, we're getting more rubber in those roots. Uh, this is with Waiuli. Um, and now we need to separate the leaves from the branches uh, in order to just extract the latex. And what we just did there to do that is you flash freeze the leaves in liquid nitrogen and then smack them, the leaves shatter, and you're left with branches you can extract latex from. Uh, this is a video, a temperature video. Uh, so you see it splash into the liquid nitrogen and now it's cold. And then you just smash the leaves and they shatter and you're left with branches uh, without leaves because uh, leaves can cause contaminations to the latex. So this next video is how we analyze our rubber samples in the roots. Uh, this instrument here allows us to detect the concentration of rubber within our roots using absorption of light. Uh, so we start with our roots. Uh, they're dried and ground down into a powder and put on this screen. Uh, and then that screen is placed over light and we can tell by how much light is absorbed by our dandelion roots just how much rubber is in those roots. Uh, so we use that process to figure out um, which dandelion plants had the most rubber. We can use that for breeding so that each cycle we can get better and better roots that have more rubber uh, so that we can get better harvests uh, and make this more of a crop. Uh, so again, that's shown through there. And then based on this spectrum, uh, we can tell how much rubber is within our samples. And so this next video, I'm gonna show you kind of the processing of rubber in the lab and then also the processing of latex. Let's see. So here we are for rubber processing. So we start with the sticky kind of amber material, uh, which is the rubber that we would have extracted from dandelions. Uh, now first, um, we have to cut it into small pieces so that it can be mixed properly with other chemicals. Uh, at this point, we need to add more things to it, but because it's such a solid block, you really can't add more chemicals. Uh, so the first step is to cut it up. Uh, some of the chemicals we add, uh, one of them is carbon, uh, which is from petroleum. And this is what actually colors your car tires black. Uh, so it's not naturally that color, it's because of this filler. Uh, some other sustainable fillers we're working with, this is actually from processing tomatoes. Uh, so it's dried uh, uh, tomato skins. Uh, and this is not an empty bowl, it's actually filled with very uh, finely ground eggshells. And so we're using those to replace carbon um, as a filler and it's more sustainable. Uh, so now the rubber pieces are put into the rubber mixer uh, which is, if you think of this like cooking, this is like your mixing bowl where you're adding all the ingredients. Uh, except for this mixing bowl, it's under high pressure and high temperature, 
and you're adding things like sulfur and carbon, uh, so nothing you'd want to eat. Uh, and so what you're left with after coming through the mixer uh, is this kind of lumpy uh, rubber material. Uh, so after that, you know, you're going to take it to the rubber mill, which is kind of like your rolling pin. And so this rolling pin, there's these two, uh, there's these two metal rollers. And so the lumpy um, black colored rubber at this point is put into the rollers and it's smoothed out, uh, rolled a number of times uh, to get it to industry standards uh, for where we'd want to see rubber. Uh, so once it, whenever it's done mixing, uh, you remove it from the rubber mill and you're left with this large sheet of rubber. Uh, and then so from that, we take it to the last step, uh, which is the rubber press. So a small piece of the rubber that came from the mill uh, is put between these two steel plates. And now this is the part in the cooking process where you take it to the oven. Uh, and so it's heated for a certain amount of time, but it's also heated under a lot of pressure, about 15 tons uh, for this heated press, uh, which is larger than an elephant. Uh, so it's just like if you're baking a cake, except there's an elephant also standing on your cake. Uh, so that's what we do uh, to get our final processed rubber. And from that, we can do different tests on this rubber sample uh, to make sure that our rubber meets industry standards. Uh, so there's our final piece of rubber. One of those tests uh, I like to call a stretchiness test. Uh, so we take a piece of that processed rubber and we're going to put it into this between these two clamps. And so those clamps are going to grab on uh, and they're going to stretch the rubber just like how you'd stretch a rubber band. So it's going to pull and pull until uh, so that we can test just how strong and how stretchy this rubber is. So it's just going to keep pulling it until we get it to snap. And that's going to happen here in just a few seconds. So it's stretching it and then snap. And once it snaps, it stops, sends all that information to the computer, and we can tell how strong and how stretchy our rubber samples are to make sure that we're making a product that's high enough quality uh, for different consumers, so like people who make tires. Uh, so this next video is how we process our latex, which is that kind of creamy uh, substance that we saw dripping out of the rubber trees and that we get from our Waiuli. So first, we're putting a metal plate onto this machine, and that plate is going to be dipped into the, to the latex. Uh, now, we use a plate because that allows us to get uh, some of the latex after it's been processed, and we can do different experiments with it. But this is the same process you would use as if you're dipping something like a rubber glove or balloons. Uh, so where that's where you have a mold, this is kind of large porcelain-looking thing that just is in the shape of a hand. So it'd be attached to that machine, dipped down into the latex, and then you could process that. So after it's been dipped into the latex, um, it's spun around to make sure you get an even coating. And now if you see this large dangly bit, uh, that's when Menica was talking about coagulation, that's what she was referring to. Uh, it's these little bits, these like larger lumps that stick to the plates and things. Um, and you really don't want that in your samples or else you have large bits of rubber stuck to your rubber gloves. Uh, so whenever we're using biotechnology to prevent coagulation, uh, we're trying to prevent that from happening. And so the plate continues to be spun around, and then it goes through a few more steps in processing in order to make a final product. And so now this next video is a stretchiness test uh, with the uh, gloves. So these three materials are made from petroleum. Uh, this is our natural rubber from our dandelions or from the rubber tree. Uh, and this last one here is from Waiuli. That's the bush that can grow in the Southwest US. And you can see that the rubber it produces is a lot stretchier and it's a lot softer uh, than some of the other kinds of rubber we're working with. Uh, so with that, those are the ends of those videos, and uh, Dr. Cornish is going to summarize a few points for us. Uh, so thank you. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you can sort of buy into this vision. So this is a map of the U.S., as you can obviously tell. But what I want to see, I want to be able to drive down Route, 80, uh, Route 83, you know, or 71, or Route 66, and then hopefully down I-10 from, uh, you know, across Arizona, California, uh, and, and Texas and New Mexico, past the fields of dandelions or the fields of Waiuli, seeing the processing plants looming in the distance, bringing our, our rubber production jobs back into the US, our latex glove dipping back here so we can make our own PPE and uh, things like that. And, and you know, we're, we're so close to making this happen that, you know, that some of you watching now, some of you youngsters, you might end up working in this industry in either agriculture or extraction processes or manufacture. And so that's, that's, that's what the goal is here, making the US self-sustainable and eventually an exporting country of rubber instead of importing more than a, million dollar, a, a billion dollars of raw materials every year and 
$20 billion worth of finished products. We can do that in our own country. So I hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. All right. So I'm going to... All right. Okay, we have a question that is this kind of research also happening in other states? So is Ohio unique in studying making rubber from new sources like these? Well, at the moment for the rubber dandelion, we are pretty much the, the only academic place in, ta in town. And we work with companies like Goodyear and American Sustainable Rubber to try and make this achievable. There are a couple of startup companies. Uh, in, there's one in Canada, there's another one in the Louis area. Um, but uh, we, have, we have more dandelions than everybody else at the moment, I think. We're also working with Nebraska, the University of Nebraska in the Panhandle, Scotts region, and also Oregon State University in the Klamath Falls region. And the dandelions really like to grow there. And we have another trial up in British Columbia because they have a longer growing season than us. Down in the Southwest, uh, there's a USDA funded project uh, run with um, Bridgestone and University of Arizona, and I think it's New Mexico State, and they are working on the Wayuli rubber. And then the, we, I have my own company, Energene, which is working on things like making the radiation attenuation gloves. And we have a text extraction pilot plant in the same location as the dandelion extraction pilot plant. So yeah, with, with a, a, a real center for it, which is appropriate because I, Ohio is the rubber capital of the world, as I expect you know. Oh, yes. Now, this is when you first showed the rubber map, it didn't look like Ohio had produced any crops that, that produced it. And you talk about Akron, how Akron became the rubber capital of the world well, because of the, uh, the automotive um, center. So this was this was rubber. Rubber was produced in Ohio um, by synthetic rubber and also by importing rubber to make tires. And Akron became the real rubber capital of the world where the big tire companies had their headquarters. And so that brought rubber manufacturing into the state, uh, and also synthetic rubber manufacturing from petroleum. And uh, it used to be a lot cheaper to import natural rubber from, the South, uh, from, from Southeast Asia than it is today. Um, so that's, that's really how it happened. And then, yes, we do work very closely with Goodyear uh, and Cooper Tire uh, in, in Ohio. Um, Cooper is very interested in the Wayuli rubber and Goodyear is more interested in the dandelion rubber. Um, so Cooper actually um, had a big grant funded project that funded when they, they actually did their tire. Um, so, it, so the answer to that is yes, we're, we're very interested in having Ohio be, and they are very interested in having Ohio farmers become major rubber producers. At the moment we only have two little pilot plants producing rubber from these two crops. Uh, the one of the stumbling blocks is is getting enough money to build a commercial scale processing plant. Uh, American Sustainable Rubber is one of the companies that's very interested in building one big enough to harvest all their hydroponic roots, but that also uh, process the field grown roots. So, what research projects are you currently working on? I will let each of my uh, uh, my colleagues here um, say very briefly what they're working on. So, Menika, so what are you? What current research projects are you working on? So, I'm working on um, molecular biology and biotech uh, improvements for rubber dandelion. Um, so, one of my projects is to increase photosynthesis in rubber dandelion so that we have more carbon um, for the rubber biosynthesis. And another project is to um, drive carbon inside the plant into rubber biosynthesis. For example, in rubber plants, a storage carbon um, carbohydrate called inulin is produced. So uh, we work driving that carbon into rubber biosynthesis in uh, rubber dandelions. So those are my major projects these days. Okay, and, and David, you. Yes, so I'm working um, 
a lot of the same kinds of things Menica are, um, working also with biotechnology and improving rubber dandelion. Um, my projects, yeah, so mine's just kind of, it's a similar topic, but to individual projects. Um, one of them is to improve, um, is to try and increase the, uh, one of the precursors that's used in rubber production. Uh, so we're trying to increase the plant's ability to make this, uh, to make this molecule. And then that molecule will hopefully be funneled into making more rubber within those plants. Uh, there's another project, um, which is closer to a breeding project um, that actually cuts the amount of DNA in the plant in half. And then we try to, and then we double that DNA again to get back to normal plant DNA levels. Uh, and then with that, we can really control a lot of the traits in rubber or see different things that happen with that. Uh, so maybe it'll really speed up the breeding process for rubber dandelion. Um, there's one I'm starting to look into now. We still have to look at grants to try and get funding for this project, but it's uh, looking at alternative um, alternative uh, fertilizer uh, sources for rubber. They, um, all plants use one specific kind of phosphorus, but there's bacteria that use another kind of phosphorus. Uh, so they've been experimenting with, in this in cotton and I believe rice. Uh, and so we're looking at bringing that into rubber dandelion. And that would really help it in fields uh, out competing like working with those weeds in fields, it would really help lumber dandelion there. Yes, and also hopefully uh, reduce phosphorus runoff as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, all algae also use the same phosphorus source as plants. And so the algae wouldn't have access to that kind of phosphorus. Yeah, and, so. and Haley, do you want to say a couple of things? Um, yeah, um, my work for this project specifically I do um, some economic analysis, and I also look at the life cycle assessment, which refers to um, the environmental impact that growing dandelions in Ohio would have, whether hydroponically or in the field. And kind of on the other side of the work I do, I look a lot of at, um, valorizing like trash so particularly thinking about like waste to energy projects, that kind of thing. Yeah, and we have a question about is growing rubber this way better for the environment? Well, we can recapture nearly all the water we use, so it's very low water uh, consumer. And then it has a really nice advantage and you can pump CO2, say from an anaerobic digester or from a coal farm power plant uh, into the indoor farming system so that the dandelions can suck up that carbon dioxide and turn it into either more rapidly growing plants or more rubber. And so it's a, it's a carbon capture system as well. So it, it can indeed be better for the environment. And we also had a question about the timeline, how long this is going to take. Well, that the consortium uh, that we work with, the universities and the companies, has reached a stage now where I think the primary limitation is capital. Remember that lemonade picture? That was the most expensive initial purchase. You have to have the lemonade picture before you can make the lemonade. Well, we've got to have the extraction plant big enough to make enough rubber lemonade to feed the people who, or to give it to the people who need it. And remember how many elephants there were, you know, there may be 12 per minute for the world, but we're using more than one a minute here plants that can uh, produce uh, at least one elephant a minute of raw material and that that's where we're at and the university is not going to be building that we will help somebody else build it but we are not going to be building the processing plant at a capital scale like that so do we have any other questions so there's no more questions. So again, thank you very much. And you can find, find us at OSU. We're easy to find if you want to ask anything later. Thank you again for your attention.